God bless you this evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Fellowship Covenant Church Bible study. I am so grateful to have you here on this wonderful October day as we continue our study as we have been exploring these last eight months, the major prophets. Thank God for your presence and for setting aside this sacred time we can study and learn God's word as he's instructed us to do. Before we go any further, please bow your heads with me and let's just invite our hearts and our minds to settle in and we can hear the spirit of the living God teach us and instruct us concerning his word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have. Though we are apart physically, Lord, we are together in your presence and we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to learn your word, to study your word. You instructed us to search the scriptures, O God, for they speak of you. You instructed us to study the scriptures, O God, and build ourselves up in your word. We pray now, Father, for clarity, for insight. We come against all distractions and, and opportunities to lose our place and our understanding of your truth. Bless us as we explore, as we learn, from your prophets of the Old Testament, the word you've left for us to learn and apply to our lives today. And we thank you and bless your holy name for this wonderful opportunity, Father, and blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, it's a wonderful thing to share God's word. We are so glad you chose to tune in this evening with us. We welcome you. My name is Elder James Dennis, and our pastor, Reverend Dr. Kanye Ray Eaton, along with our entire community, welcome you wherever you are to be a part as we learn more about our major prophets. So what's in the name? What's the significance of someone's name? In our culture, as I said last week, many times we just inherit names, juniors and seniors and the third and the fourth, basically carrying on traditions, which is beautiful as well. But we learn as we study the word of God in the Old Testament, most of the names in the Old Testament are always associated with, they mean something. Their names have a meaning to them. Now we've been studying Ezekiel since our minister Mary Ann Patterson began this journey with us the first part of September. We are now on our lesson six. And we've talked about Ezekiel now and we've seen some of his mannerisms and we've learned the historical component of where he showed up. What's the context of Ezekiel? The name in Hebrew is spelled Y-E-H-E-Z-Q-U-E, and it represents, and there's two schools of thought in biblical studies. One, his parents gave him the name Ezekiel, and in doing so, were they affirming him, or war was it an appeal? Reason why that's always been a debate is because Ezekiel is a prophet who prophesied his entire time of his life. He prophesied his whole book. He did it in exile. So prior to him being in exile, there was a king named Josiah who really came to reform Israel or Judah and get them off the path they were headed to for destruction. But he was killed. And then Ezekiel was born. And what his parents naming him as a sign that God's going to work things out, or was it a sign crying out, God give us faith to go through, we need strength. So many people are not sure on just what the name, what the context of the name is. We know what was going on historically, what was it an appeal, God strengthen us, or was it, was it an affirmation saying God strengthens, we're able to go through what's in front of us. Either way, it's an interesting thought, an interesting debate, but the name Ezekiel, for our purposes tonight, will be the God strengthens. But there's also another name of Ezekiel that we're going to talk about a little bit. Ezekiel is one of the most spirit-spoken-about scriptures in the Word of God. So we call God strengthens. But what's so powerful about Ezekiel that we'll look to is that Ezekiel, the word spirit, is mentioned more in the book of Ezekiel than any other book in the Old Testament. You got that right. So what it's saying is that it may be that God strengthens, but Ezekiel is spoken to, the spirit 
is used in the connotation of wind or blow or mass movement. He uses the Hebrew word for spirit when he uses that. We might interpret it through the interpreters as wind, but the Hebrew word is actually spirit. So there are 52 occurrences of spirit in the book of Ezekiel, more than Isaiah, more than Jeremiah. Matter of fact, even more than Leviticus, the word spirit is used. So it could be by chance that the name Ezekiel really could also suggest that the book stands for the prophet of the spirit. He's a prophet who speaks and spends all of his visions, all of his connotations, he's opened up. The Spirit of God is relaying to him over and over again what thus saith the Lord. Let's look now at the book of Ezekiel as an overview. We've gone through this. We're going to go quickly, but it's important to note. And I want you to pay attention and jot this down as you have your Bibles and your eyeglasses and your pads available. Know that Ezekiel, from chapters 1 through 24, Everything that Ezekiel says from chapter 1 to 24 are all said before Jerusalem falls. So Jerusalem falls, but prior to it falling, God is giving Ezekiel visions and oracles and messages to proclaim to Jerusalem even before the temple was ransacked and Jerusalem was completely taken over by the Babylonians. So we have all of this stuff leading up. Let me tell you this too. Ezekiel's exile to Babylon. We've been studying that for the last four or five weeks. He's at the river Shabar. While he is there, he begins to prophesy, but after being there for seven years. So all the exiles, there's three exiles, He's in the second group. Many believe with Daniel. He goes to Babylon under captivity in the orders of Nebuchadnezzar. And while he is there, while he is there, they're just sitting by the river hoping to get a train back to Jerusalem as soon as possible. But all of the time he spends there, there's no word from God. There's no message. There's no vision. There's nothing. It's not until year seven, while he's in exile, the chapter 1 and his calling take place. So he's there from chapter 1 through chapter 24. He's prophesying to the exiles, folk who are in Babylon, who are biting at the bit to get back, biting at the bit to get back to Jerusalem. But while he's in exile in Babylon, what amazes Ezekiel, is know what amazes him? That God shows up. Well, they're sitting at the river hoping to get back to Jerusalem, believing the false prophets at that time when Babylon will be short. While they're there, while they're there, in a foreign nation with pagan gods, as dark as it can be, the word of God calls the son of God, Ezekiel, to prophesy. Now, Ezekiel's all in his mind, his whole life trajectory, prior to being exiled, was to be a priest. He's of the priest descendant line. He's expecting to be a priest. He worked in the temple in Jerusalem, but then he got exiled, expecting perhaps that his priesthood days or ambition would never come to fruition. And guess what? They don't. Instead, he's redirected from being a priest to being a prophet. And that is amazing. And what's even more amazing is that God speaks to Ezekiel where? In a pagan nation. God is never silent, people of God. God is never silent. He speaks wherever you are. If you want to hear his voice, he'll speak. So we thank God and remember now that the Jews are spread out all over the place. Ezekiel's prophesying in Babylon. That's the overview of the book. Then we get into some prophecies of, ju of judgment against Israel. This is really a lot of this is what Sister Mary Ann, our minister Mary Ann, covered for us the first four weeks of September. Prophecies, judgment against Israel, judgment against Israel. Then chapter 25, which we're going to touch on tonight, 
through 32 really take a break from the judgments of, of the judgments of Israel to what? To the judgments and the messages and the oracles to the foreign nations. The nations get a message now. And then it ends from 33 to 48. It ends with a proclamation of hope. But let me just say this real quick before let's not forget this. What's important is this. This is amazing. He's prophesying to the nations. He's already proclaimed what the judgment will be against Israel. So the nations, Israel, all get their judgment. All of them get what's going to happen to them. And isn't it amazing? All of this takes place. All of this takes place just about before Jerusalem falls. Now, here's what's amazing. Right at the end of chapter 32, Chapter 33, it's about 586 B.C., and guess what happens at the beginning of chapter 33? You got it. Jerusalem falls. Falls. Now Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple, God's glory, everything in Jerusalem is left in devastation. And that's when he begins the proclamation of hope. Isn't God great? Isn't God absolutely amazing? He begins to share the hope after it looks as dismal as it can be. After it looks like there's no sight of relief. Then Ezekiel gets a word from the Lord to proclaim hope that they're coming back. He's already taken care of the judgment on Israel. They're going to go and Jerusalem will be destroyed. The message to the nations, they'll be punished as well. After all the punishments have been, been communicated, then Jerusalem falls, and then the prophet is given a vision saying, there's hope. God is, it's never too late. It is never over. We sang a song this past Sunday, hopefully you were with us. We sang a wonderful song that Jesus has never lost a battle. This battle that we're going through, whatever you're going through, know this, he's never lost a battle. So looking at this overview of the book of Ezekiel, we want to spend a minute or two just in the foreign nations. And before we get to the foreign nations, I want to explain something to you. The question comes down, if the foreign nations are not God's chosen people, why does he even bother with them? Why does he spend any time, messages and oracles and judgments on the foreign nations? Why would he do that? Well, the reason why God does that, oh no, do me a favor, get your Bibles out, wherever you are right now, grab a Bible. I'm not going to put this slide up, we're going to stay right there on the screens, but look in at me, look at Ezekiel chapter 28, wherever you are. Get your glasses if you need them, all right? Look at Ezekiel 28, and look at what it says in verse 24. Ezekiel 28, verse 24. Read that with me as I read it aloud. And for the house of Israel, there shall be no more a briar to prick or a thorn to hurt them among all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I am the Lord. That's Ezekiel 28. Look at what it says in 25, 28 and 25 now. Thus says the Lord God, when I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations, then they shall dwell in their own land that I gave to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell securely in it. They shall build houses, plant vineyards, they shall dwell securely when I execute judgments upon all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I am the Lord, their God. Listen, to, circle that text in your Bible. Here's what he's saying. This is so fabulous. This is why we're in the library today, to understand what's going on with all these oracles that Ezekiel's been proclaiming. And why would God judge the nations? The nations aren't part of the covenant. They're not part of Abraham's chosen nation. They're not part of the promise. But why would he judge them? Because they're enemies to Israel. And what God is saying in this text is, listen, 
I'm going to destroy the nations and the neighbors who brought contempt to you. Because I want you to dwell securely, safely, and prosper, and prosper in the land that I have dedicated and called for you to have. God will take care of your enemies. God, and those enemies today, they may not be people, but God can reverse the economy. So the money he blesses you with doesn't go out one door and, out and come in one way and out the other way quickly. He'll invest the cost of things for you. He'll, he'll, he'll create opportunities for you when time is right, for you to get right on the path he has for you. That's the kind of God. So he judges the foreign nations. Now, everyone should know by now, foreign nations. We're going to reverse the order. We're going to start tonight with the foreign nations. Then we're going to pick up from last week and knock out the 16th and the 23rd chapter. And then we're going to wrap up tonight with a very interesting title that's used consistently in the book of Ezekiel. First of all, foreign nations. Now, I'm hoping that everybody who has been engaged with us in Bible study for at least the last three years, at least, we studied the minor prophets, we studied Genesis, and we studied now the major prophets. I trust that each one of you have already learned, even we studied Genesis, we got into, into Noah and the families and every, how, how the whole nation was created from people. We use the word nations. You have to always remember, when you see in the Old Testament the name, the word nations, is always referring to the definition on next slide says, the group of people linked by kinship, land, culture, or government in the Bible. The nations, especially, I will say in most cases, refers to those who are not Israelites. We have to understand that. So every nation, every city, every region, that wasn't part of God's promised land for his people to dwell, that were not part or were not circumcised, how's that, uncircumcised, not part of the Abrahamic covenant, did not obey the laws of Moses, they were considered nations. They were considered nations. They don't refer to God's elect people. So Paul says in Acts, Luke says in Acts 17 chapter, from one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. He allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he's not far from each one of us. So well, the nations were not a part of the chosen people that he promised Abraham. He still put these people into groups by their culture, by their kinship, by their land. They formed, they formed nations from Philistia, Ammon, Tyre, Egypt. They're all people. And what he put in their hearts was a desire someday to grope, to desire, to pursue him. Now, many of them replaced that desire with pagan gods, with false worship. But the ultimate goal is that God's going to draw them into. You and I, non-Jewish believers, are considered having been Gentiles. But now in Christ, Jew nor Gentile, male nor free, bond nor free, male nor free, bond nor free are all one in Christ Jesus. So we want to understand that. But anyway, we talked about chapters 25 through 32, all the oracles against the nations. Now, looking at our next slide, we're going to learn now again, we've talked about this in Isaiah, what is an oracle? We pull a library book off the shelf and we see an oracle is a communication from God, both a, in some cases, it's a response to a question that people have. Remember in Habakkuk? Habakkuk when he was wondering why are things going the way they are, and all of a sudden he got a word from God, he got an oracle, a message to proclaim about even if there's no sheep in the stall, even if there's no, there's no fruit on the vine, yet praise God, he got a response to his agony. 
an oracle is a response to a question, or as we've seen so far in Ezekiel, an oracle is also a pronouncement, a pronouncement made by God without his being even asked. I'm bringing judgment on these people. Those are oracles. The foreign nation oracles demonstrated the sovereignty. Why would God give a foreign nation an oracle, a message? Because it shows the sovereignty of God. It shows that even though these people don't worship God, he's still in control. He's still in control. And also it shows us that sin is going to be punished by Jew, by Gentile, by rich or by poor, by male or by female, by bond or free, all sin will be punished. National sins like aggression, atrocities, breaking of covenants, deserve God's wrath. Whether they are Jews or Gentile, they're going to be punished. So in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, in these chapters, we will hear and read about the judgments the oracles toward seven, seven nations. Let's see if you hear their name, whether you remember hearing about them before. Ammon, Moab, Edom, Egypt, Philistia, Tyre, and Sidon. Those are the seven nations that Ezekiel gets an oracle from God to proclaim what will happen to these nations? They will be punished. Now, we said earlier, Minister Patterson took us through chapters 1 through 24 or so about the punishment and the judgment on Israel. Now, Israel gets a break. No more judgment for a while now coming from Ezekiel's mouth toward them. But word comes to Ezekiel from God about the judgments that are going to come on the nations. The foreign, the foreign nations, the pagan, the Gentiles who do not honor God. But because God's sovereign and because they have sinned, aggression, atrocities, and they bring contempt on God's people, God says, listen, I know what they've done. I know the, I know the pain and agony they brought upon you. I will punish them as well. So Ezekiel spends the first two-thirds of his book going over the punishments of both Israel and the punishments of foreign nations. One of those nations is a nation of Ammon. Now, I want you to pay attention. Have you noticed anything? Have you noticed that there are seven nations, big nations, Egypt, Egypt alone, if we read all of these chapters, Egypt alone, there are seven sermons, seven oracles just to Egypt, and then there's one oracle to the other seven nations. You follow? So Ammon has one oracle, one judgment coming to them. We'll read about it in a second. Egypt has seven oracles. There's seven messages that God gives Ezekiel to tell Egypt. Now, mighty Egypt. Here's an example of an oracle, a judgment. Let's read this one together. Get your Bibles out if you can or read along me on the screens. In, e in Ezekiel 25, 1 through 4, the nations call Ammon. Notice what it says. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward the Ammonite and prophesy against them, Ammonites, and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, ah, over my sanctuary when it was profaned, over the land of Israel when it was made desolate, over the house of Judah, when they went into exile. Therefore, behold, I am handing you over to the people of the east for a possession, and they shall set their encampments among you and make their dwelling in your midst. They shall eat your fruit, and they shall drink your milk. Verse 5 through 7. I will make Reba a pasture for camels of Ammon, a foal for flocks, then you will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, because you have clapped your hands, stamped your feet, and rejoiced with all the malice within your soul against the land of Israel. Therefore, behold, 
I have stretched out my hand against you and will hand you over to, as plunder to the nations. And I will cut you off from the people and will make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you, then you will know that I am the Lord. Do you see that? So the judgment coming against these nations is severe. Now, we said there were seven nations. Each one, except for Egypt, got one oracle, short oracle. These, like four or five verses. But Egypt received seven. So God's going to really plunder Egypt. And there are many schools of thought as to why. One school is that Egypt has always been who Israel has gone to when things got difficult. Instead of them lining up with God for protection or provision or direction, given their ancestry back in Egypt, many of them were still prone to go back to Egypt where they were once in bondage, but they thought they were living safely and looked to them for security. Oh, how foolish. It is to go back to what God delivered you from for a sense of security. So God says, Egypt, to the people of God, I'm going to really punish Egypt because you thought they could not be beat. They were somehow invincible. I'm going to show you where you go to for help in your worst hour is not where you need to go. You need to come to me. I am the rock, not Egypt. I can use Egypt. I can use any country I want to, but understand that I'm the only security you can ever find that won't fail. Now, if you're curious about all seven of these nations, think about it for a second. Is a nation missing there? If God's going to bring judgment against all the nations, what nation is not on that list? What nation is not listed there? Isn't it interesting that there are seven, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Egypt, Sudan, Tyre, and Philistia? Where is blank? Anybody know what major nation that has brought contempt and pain on Israel is missing from this list? If you've been paying half attention You've heard me mention this nation over and over again. It's a mighty nation. Think for a moment, what nation is missing? How many said Babylon? Yes, that's the correct answer. Babylon's missing. Scholars don't understand. How could God not judge Babylon? They brought e tremendous, tremendous pain to Egypt. You know how? Because of this. Many believe because Ezekiel is in Babylon and for him to proclaim judgment against the country where he is would sure enough put him in danger of living beyond the day he could proclaim that message. So God reserved telling him about what's going to happen to them, but something does happen to them, Nebuchadnezzar and the whole host, but Egypt, that message regarding Babylon is not conveyed at this time to Ezekiel. Now, we said last, we're going to get into it this week, one of the major dominant themes in the book of Ezekiel is a symbol of, of marriage. Marriage is huge. And we want to make sure, before we leave this book, you understand why. Because this is a metaphor it's an allegory. It's used over and over, more so in all the prophets. Marriage, we talked about once. It says in Malachi chapter 2, verse 14, he says, But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Then he says in the book of Isaiah 50, he uses a very powerful language. He says, which is your mother, mother's certificate of divorce, with which I sent her away. So over and over again, the word marriage is a dominant symbol in, in the book, in all the prophets, but primarily in chapters 16 and 23. 
And in discussion, the word marriage is used to suggest a covenant. It's used to suggest a strong covenant. So looking at chapter 16 to 23, um, just look at this. Our next slide. He says something amazing here. Here's an example of how God looks at Israel and his people. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and 34, it reads, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the, their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, <coughs> excuse me, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Do you see? God looked at covenant, his people, as being in a marriage with him. Covenant, husband, wife, connection, commitment, faithfulness, essential ingredients to any marriage. God uses that metaphor to suggest, I'm going to be a faithful husband. I expect you to honor our covenant. Don't let anything come in between to break it because the consequences of a broken covenant is devastating. Devastating. Think about this. Israel, the northern kingdom, you got two kingdoms, right? The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, which Egypt, which is what Ezekiel's prophesying primarily to, the northern kingdom has been in bondage after 290 years of being in a covenant with God, the northern kingdom spent years, years violating the covenant, violating it, violating it, breaking their, their commitment to God. And what happened? The Assyrians came, and now you don't hear about the northern kingdom in Ezekiel. Nothing. They're done. Now he's using the same vernacular over and over again, covenant, marriage, husband, wife, Israel's the wife, God's the husband. And the theme around covenant is huge. Here's what you have to understand about the covenant. <clears throat> In the book of Isaiah, our next slide, it says, the earth dries up and withers, the world languishes and withers. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumed the earth. I want this to be so clear. Covenant in the word of God is defined as a binding and solemn agreement made by two or more individuals. In the scriptures, the Lord made many covenants with his children. These were not only binding, contracts to keep the children of Israel in the purposes of the Lord. They were also a means of protection. Anytime a covenant is made with God, anytime, anytime, Satan will attempt to destroy the pack because he realizes that if he can, through deception, break the pack by deceiving that by defiling the covenant, it opens the door for him to come in and destroy. Now, why does God bring, allow this wrath, this punishment to come on the children of Israel? Because they broke the covenant. When you break the covenant, it doesn't just violate and defile your position before God. You also open up the door for Satan to come in and run ransack in your life. When you bring darkness into your life, the enemy desires to lodge in it. When you bring darkness, when we bring darkness into our life, we open the door. That's why Paul says in the New Testament, right? He says what? Give no place to the devil. When you give place, and one of the places that we give is we break our covenant with God, you allow Satan to come in deceive and destroy and bring destruction to the life. And that's what happened. That's why God uses 
these words over and over again about the covenant being broken, about a marriage being severed, about a husband being brokenhearted by the wife's unfaithfulness over and over again. Now, looking at these verses quickly, in chapter 16, we see a perpetuation of adultery, fornication, prostitution. They're all propagated in an area. The enemy gains control. When the enemy gets in, these things follow. Adultery, fornication, even in our time today, when we allow darkness to come into our life, the enemy gets his foothold in. He has gained control. And this is what the land of Israel has experienced. Famine, floods, beasts going wild, pestilent, swords, war. Because there's been a violation of a covenant, all manner of sin can run ransack. Now listen, if you look at our country today, they call it global warming. Warming, Global warming. We call it over and over again. We can somehow correct this by reducing our pollution and emissions and cars. But listen, listen, listen. Think about it. The covenant of committing to God. We live in a country that's full of, of injustice, that's full of violence, full of trickery, political lies and schemes, hatred and violence. How much of our disobedience to God is bringing the catastrophes that we see every day from floods last week. The fire is over the, we went outside back in July, you couldn't even stand outside without getting choked up with the smoke. Is any of this have to do with breaking the covenant? A nation that forgets God. Sin is a reproach on any people. When you forget God, we open the door to calamities. We open the door and think about it. The Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. You can't fix this earth. It doesn't belong to you. Scientists can't fix it. The only way to resolve some of these things is a massive international, worldwide, global call of repentance. Forgive us, Lord. We've lingered and strayed so far away. We see this happening in Israel with Ezekiel. He's saying this is what's going to happen. This ongoing breaking of covenant, breaking of a marriage will bring this destruction. Let's go to reading a verse here now. Look at what he says in Ezekiel 16 and 24. He says, you built a mount for yourself, made a lofty shrine in every public square. At the head of every street you built, your lofty shrines and degraded your beauty, offering your body with increasing promiscuity to anyone who passed by. You engaged in what? Prostitution with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors. You provoked me to anger with your increased promiscuity. So I stretched out my hand against you and reduced your territory. Listen, when we live in sin, when we harbor ungodliness, whatever God gave you, he can shrink, shrink it. You wonder why sometimes things aren't working out? It's because we harbor, we mount up, we, we, we get in bed with sin. We break our covenant with God, and these things will follow. Fornication and prostitution. Then he says in Ezekiel 23, 37 through 38, this is the word of God. Ohola, Oholabah, have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. They committed adultery with their idols. They even sacrificed their children, whom they bore to me as food for them. They have also done this to me. At that same time, they defiled my sanctuary and desecrated my Sabbath. Listen. Here's what this is saying. Let's bring this into 2023. Many of us have committed adultery, have wedded, have put things that we feel are absolutely essential. We've gone to bed with our idols. What is an idol? An idol is anything that I feel I absolutely, positively have to have to be happy. 
I need that more than I even need God's favor. Sometimes we see people make autonomy an idol. They make freedom an idol. They make money an idol. They make independence an idol. When those things become your consuming desire, the easiest way to think about what an idol might be in your life is this. What do you think about the most? Right now, what's in your mind the most? The day is over, Wednesday's about to come to a close. What have you spent most of your thoughts on for today? Whatever you consumes your thinking, whatever drives you and keeps you moving, in many cases, is an idol. And when that becomes essential and all-encompassing for you, it now commits, you get into bed with it, it becomes a breaking of God's covenant with you. It's committing adultery. That's what he says in this text. And that's what Israel did. And he uses these allegories and messages to give them understanding on that. Let's read the 16th chapter for a couple of verses, then we're going to move on through. 16th chapter of Ezekiel, verse 1 through 3. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abomination. Now, abomination is the most severe word used in the Old Testament when you violate God's promises. There's nothing more severe than abomination. That means you've known what to do, heard what God said, but you choose to dismiss it to meet a need. So Jerusalem make known her abomination. And he, she, she says, and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in squalling cloths, nor I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you. But you were cast out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you, Wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live, live, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant of the field. And you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair grown. Yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. I spread the corner of my garment over you. Encourage your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God. You became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth, sod you with the fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered your silk. Oh my God, what a story! What a story! A baby is found herself out floundering in her blood, birth blood, out in the field, wailing and waiting for the carpenters, for the buzzards to come and devour her. But what happens? God prevents the buzzards to come and he rescues this child. He rescues. First, he saves the baby's life. He rescues her from a certain death. She's in her blood. He adopts her as his own daughter. He pronounces a sentence of life. He says, listen, not death, but you're going to live. You're going to live. This is the word of God to the people of Israel. He says, I made you live. I harnessed you. I made you mine. You needed a parent. I became your parent. Now, he says, in your blood live. This all signifies the love of God the grace of God. And after he's done all these things, all these things that he did, he rescued us. Then, now we're grown. He even put clothes on us. Many of us can relate to, I came to this country, I came to this nation, I didn't get through school, I didn't do this, I wish I had but all of these things that didn't work out for us, but guess what happens? In the midst of all these things, God saved us. And now that he saved us, what do we do with it? Do we go out now 
and, wor- and wed and marry idols and go to bed with idols that weren't there and we needed them? Is that what we do? What do we do? That's what he's saying. That's the word of the Lord speaking to us today. What do you do? And that's what Ezekiel's saying. You were that baby in the field with the blood birth on your body. And he came, rescued you, protected you, adopted you, married you, clothed you, and look at you now. You finally got status and you walk away from the one who rescued you. My God, he doesn't deserve to be treated that way. Now, let's go to the next one. In, in, in Ezekiel 23, we're going to wrap up in a moment now. 23 and 1, another example of how they broke the covenant. Ezekiel 23 and 1, and it reads, Where the Lord came to me, mortal man. If I see that, meaning son of man. There were two women, the daughters of one mother. They played the whore in Egypt. They played the whore in their youth. There their breasts were pressed and their virgin bosoms handled. They played the whore in Egypt. They played the whore in their youth. Their breasts were pressed. We go on about what's going on with them. Go to verse 4 and 5. And he says, Ola was the name of the elder and Ola Bar, the name of her sister. They became mine. They and they bore sons and daughters as their names. Ola Ohola is Samarian. Ohola Bar is Jerusalem. Ohola played the whore while she was mine. She lusted after her lovers, the Assyrian warriors. Okay? Ohola, Ohola played the whore while she was mine, the Assyrian lovers. Let's go to the next one. She bestowed her whoring upon them, the choicest men of Assyria, all of them. And she defiled herself with all the idols of everyone after whom she lusted. Therefore, I delivered her into the hands of her lovers, into the hands of the Assyrians, after whom she lusted. You want to be, you want the Assyrians, you want the power, you want the job, you want the money, you want the prestige. Go ahead, you can have it now. But let me tell you this, he's saying, you're not going to like it over there. And now the northern kingdom, which represented by the woman named Ohola, is in captivity in Assyria after 209 years of whoring, of living with the choicest men, of idling the Assyrians. Remember, when, when, when Egypt was going to attack the northern kingdom, they ran to Assyria for help. And now Assyria captured them. And now they're slaves because sin never lets you free. You always get more than you expected when you go to bed with sin and nothing that you really needed. Now let's look at our next verse. He says that the same thing happened to the other woman, his, her sister, Holobah. She went to bed with the Egyptians. So all of these metaphors that we talk about in this 23rd chapter all line up with what happens when we are not faithful to God. And the metaphor, now you might say the language is, is, is pretty lewd and very inappropriate. Listen, let me explain this to you. The interpreters of these scrolls that were left at the centuries and centuries, the interpreters wanted to honor what was said. They took what was written and tried to put it into our language to understand it. Now, those words might feel kind of like you don't want your kids to hear them, and I get that. This is important. We said this last week. The word of God was not written to us, but written for us. So what's for us in these texts is a whole bar and a whole Both of them represent two lead, one lusting after this, the other one yearning for that, going after it more than going after God, and then living with the consequences. And the consequences are what happened to both Judah and what happened to Israel. The southern kingdom and the northern kingdom are in bondage, captivity, and their nation that they always took pride in has been devastated because of their idolatry, because of their adultery, because of their prostitution and their fornication with idol gods. That is the message. And not just the body of people get afflicted, but the land that they live in is also punished and judged. Okay? Now, last point for tonight 
the word son of man, Ezekiel. If you study over and over again the book of Ezekiel, you're going to notice something. God never, ever refers to Ezekiel as prophet or as Ezekiel. He always refers to him as son of man. There's a reason for that. The primary reason for that is this. God realizes, let's go to our next slide. God realizes this. The phrase ben, ben Adam, which is son of man, occurs 93 times in the book of Ezekiel. Apart from the book of Daniel, the expression occurs nowhere else in the Old Testament. The phrase highlights Ezekiel's humanity, his membership in the human race. God reminds him constantly of the class to which he belongs. His primary identification is with his audience, not with the one who sent him. Everybody, listen closely. We're going to wrap up in two seconds, two minutes. Don't go. Don't get drift. Don't, don't lose your focus. God uses the calling. He says to Ezekiel over and over again, mortal man. Look at our next slide. Over and over again. You can see all these instances. Son of man, speak. Will you judge them? Verse 4. Will you judge them? Son of man, will you judge them? Verse 27. Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel. Verse 46, son of man, set your face toward the southland. He uses the word, he uses the address, he addresses Ezekiel over and over again as son of man because he doesn't want Ezekiel to forget this. I'm opening up your mind, your heart, your eyes to deep and spiritual things. Ezekiel sees the throne of God. But I don't want you to forget something, Ezekiel. You're part of the same human race that I'm punishing. Because I'm giving you revelation, here's a reminder, you too are human. And you need my grace, just like all these other people who you're preaching to need grace. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. You can learn the Bible inside and out, but at the end of the day, you're still a son of man. You're still human. And what gets you through every day is not your knowledge, not your education, not your wealth, not your experience, not your ingenuity. What gets you through is one thing. You know what that is? The grace of God. We are all humans. That's why David says, what is humanity? That thou art mindful of him. Why do you even deal with, what is the son of man, us? That you are thoughtful of us. What he, every time you see the word son of man, you should pop up in your mind, grace. Grace. Nothing but grace. Let's go to our giving slide. Pay close attention. We're going to come back to our research question in a moment, but there's ways to give. Listen closely, and please consider giving tonight. House with an offering. There are a variety of ways for you to give. You can give via Cash App to Dollar Sign FCC Finance, by PayPal to FCC Provision for the Vision at gmail.com, mail a check to Fellowship Covenant Church, give online through our website at www.fellowshipcovenant.church, or give via Zelle to FCC Provision for the Vision at gmail.com. We are so grateful for your generosity, and we thank you for your offering and gifts. Now, please stay tuned for our benediction. Okay, quickly, question for us from last week. Let's wrap this question up. Research question for Bible scholars, all of you listening. What two things did Jeremiah, Zechariah, John the Baptist, and Ezekiel have in common? Two things. What were they? If you know they are, before I give you the answer, jot it in the chat, okay? What two things did Jeremiah, Zechariah, John the Baptist, Ezekiel have in common? The answer, one thing we know for a fact, all of these four people were born in priestly descent, lineage. They were all on the trajectory to be priests. They were all born of the seed of being priests. Right? That's number one. John the Baptist's father in the New Testament, his name was Zacharias, right? And he was serving in the temple, 
where God spoke to him. He was a priest serving in the temple in, in the book of Luke, one and five, serving in the temple. All right? So that means John the Baptist was also designated to serve in the temple, like his father. Right? Son of Zechariah will be serving in the temple. Ezekiel is going to be serving in the temple as a priest. Jeremiah also serving in the temple as a priest. Zechariah serving in the temple as a priest. If he follows his father's lineage, sons of. Now, that's number one. What's number two? All four of them got redirected from being what their descendant order would suggest them to be to being prophets. Jeremiah, Zechariah, John the Baptist, and Ezekiel, all four were on a trajectory to be a priest and serve in the temple, but ended up being redirected by the Holy Spirit to be prophets. Prophets. All four ended up being prophets. The last prophet of the, of the Old Testament was who? John the Baptist. God bless you tonight. I have enjoyed being with you as we wrap up lesson number six. It has just been a privilege to share these two weeks with you out of the book of Ezekiel. Hopefully you benefit from them, and now you're ready to launch the final, the final two weeks of Ezekiel or coming right up for next Wednesday. Be sure to be here. God bless you. It's an honor to have this opportunity to share with you tonight. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for the gift, the privilege to share your word. We pray that your word would give us understanding. True knowledge will build us up not puff us up, but build us up. We might be vessels fit for your service, disciples who represent you of all things. Keep us now. Bless those who gave in our offering, who generously give every week to continue the furtherance of this ministry. We bless and praise you now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, family. Wherever you are, I look forward to seeing you again on Sunday, God's willing. You keep us in your prayers as we'll be praying for you as well. God bless you, and thank God for our media team allowing us to come to your homes. Love you. God bless you, and take care.